Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site in Brooklyn, in New York. We are gonna be talking about all things heart, all things unity, all things urban wellness, spirituality, mental health and well-being. I'm super excited and grateful and blessed to be sitting down with Alexa Eden. Hello. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thanks for coming on to our show. Really appreciate it. Very much looking forward to diving into all the things. Yes, there's lots of things. Very pumped, very pumped. Um, Alexa is an urban wellness consultant, and she's been working with multiple clients over multiple years on this. And we're excited to even, you know, to bridge the subject of what this even is and also dive into the nuance of why it's so important and we're going to start by explaining this on like a big history level. So, okay, we find ourselves as stewards of Earth after such a long period of evolution. And we're hockey sticking up in terms of our population, in terms of exponential technology, in terms of so many people crammed into metropolises like Manhattan. And like these Chinese cities, there's so many people crammed into, into these network effect metropolises slowing down to tie ourselves into the heart, into nature, into each other at a deeper level is so important. Tell us more about this whole idea of urban wellness consulting. Absolutely. So you say that it is important and that is very true, but more than it being important is how we do it. So that's where I come in and that's what I really stand behind is really educating people on how to tap into this power of our heart and our communication and connection with others. In these metropolis cities, the irony is that we live among so many people and yet we, we're desensitized to people. So how does that make sense? Where my work comes into play is recognizing that as human beings, we have a responsibility to learn our human capabilities. And in that process, we give ourselves the abilities and the tools to use technology to our advantage. However, we're at risk because as technology advances and evolves, we're allowing it to control us. So a lot of the big conversation and the, and, and the way that we're really moving this narrative is, is when you start to recognize that as human beings, we have autonomy and freedom to learn our capabilities we start to break through this hold that technology has on us. And so a lot of the conversation right now, and we've talked about this before, is that technology is impacting our well-being. Well-being is a really big umbrella statement. It's not really, it's not really pointing to anything in specific. But when you start to dissect well-being in the many different arenas, so that's mental well-being, spiritual well-being, physical well-being, social, emotional well-being. Those are all really important components to us being well human beings. So I like to shine a spotlight on all those individual things and then kind of take it from there. <laughs> I love how you're gonna walk us through the importance of these subcategories of well-being social, emotional, mental, spiritual, physical, all of these are so crucial to unpacking their nuance because breaking this down into the nuance is crucial because there's such deep depth to each one of these. And to, like you said, have these, have these as actionable things in this urban environment to be really well. Okay, okay. I, I also want to, there's something about this conversation that may be slightly weird for people to potentially feel that, oh, okay, I'm desensitized. Why am I being part of this desensitized thing? Well, we are all becoming more desensitized because we are accidentally dehumanizing each other. We're accidentally not living in our hearts so much. It's just our collective learning over time and civilization has prioritized the intelligence of the mind and the intelligence of the math and the language and the science and the history and these sort of literatures, those are really important, but we, we weren't prioritizing the emotional well-being, this heart-centric well-being. 
So they go hand in hand. So we're really adding the heart-centric well-being back into the equation of civilization and technology at a deeper level, which is going to help us deal with that hockey stick exponential technology and, and growth of population. And, and now more than ever. Because as technology is increasing at an accelerated rate in our lives, human, humanity needs to also be a player. So we need to learn these human capabilities so we can actually use the technology. We have to increase at the same speed, at the same rate. So I feel that a lot of this heart stuff, up until recently, hasn't really been given that much leverage. But the one thing that is for sure is that AI, no matter how smart, will never have a heart like we really have it. Wizard of Oz comes up for me when we're just speaking. You'll never have a real heart. Humans have such an amazing capability. And as we start to use technology to take over some of our simple tasks, we're giving over our freedoms in certain ways. So knowing where we can kind of take that back. I think it's important, especially when we live in urban cities, because technology is how we get around. A lot of what I see today, people complain because the first thing that they do in the morning, they wake up and they check their phone. And then they're constantly looking at screens. And what are they missing when they're looking at their screens? This whole world around them. The beauty of the whole world around them and also tuning deep into their own world inside of themselves. With the rapid access of, oh, I'm feeling like I'm slightly bored. Oh, I must tap into the interwebs. How about you tap into the trees and the cars and the buildings and the humans around you and your own emotional state of how you're actually feeling in that moment. Maybe you can gain some, some awe and some bliss and some appreciation for all of the billions of humans that built these structures that you now use. I mean, I consider the amount of screen time we all spend I don't even want to say the average amount of time. 150 uses per day. Yeah. Plus, it's because we spend our jobs also. I was just going to say that's just our phones, but what about our computers? Yeah. So. It's over eight hours. It's consuming. Eight hours consuming. And what happens if you keep stuffing things in your, in your, in your laundry? It, at some point, it, it, it's not going to work anymore. So we're sitting here for hours on end, consuming and consuming and consuming, with no outlet, with no process time, with no creation. So where does that leave us? It's like a really, really important thing to be talking about when we talk about technology and how it's impacting us as humans in a social and emotional way. Yeah. So. Just taking one step backwards for one second, when we talk about well-being, and we make those distinctions, yeah. for a while, athleisure came out, and that was cool. And then wellness came out, and that was green smoothies. And, and so when you think of wellness, the wellness industry, it's like yoga. green smoothies and yoga. And I, am, I got my great athleisure and on. And there's that actual yogi that comes from the East and is like, what are you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> And we're just like, uh, so, but now the next part is consciousness. Because now we understand that wellness is important. But what is more than that? Consciousness. Awakening. Awakening. And then after that, it's human optimization. Because now once we have the awareness, now we can optimize. And what does that look like? And so now it's kind of this whole journey and process. And then that's on an individual level. But the way that an individual who's now taken care of their well-being in all areas and is now tapping into the consciousness in their capabilities and then now is researching ways to be optimized as a human being, how do they show up in the world? How do they show up in their families? How do they show up as a leader? All these things are really, really crucial. But this is the conversation. And it can't just be a conversation. It has to start going into education. Yeah. And so 
where are the companies? Where are the big brands? What do they have to say about this? It's really important. Yes, yes, because the fact is, is that YouTube controls the eyeballs, the perception of two billion human animals. Facebook controls the perception of two billion human animals. Tencent does as well in China. These are tremendous numbers. These are huge numbers and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that much power and where is the where is the algorithm that sees me watching a guitar video and says, hmm, Alan, Alexa is a mile nearby you. She knows how to play guitar. Do you want to meet up with her? You're learning, you're look, looking at physics videos right now. Do you want to go meet up with Eric who studied physics? He's half a mile away from you. You want to go schedule a meeting with him, walk over there? We have so much more power in what this can actually do with tech, human to human, eye to eye, and that we're missing out on. There's a lot of, that happens with the business plans and all this other kind of stuff, but you're so right, and they need to be leaders. We need to help them become leaders, and we ourselves need to become leaders. You mentioned this crucial importance of the individual awakening, and then helping the family and community awaken, and then the earth awaken together. So shall we break down the process for one to all the different wellnesses and yeah I mean I think even you know what does it look like to take the reins yeah let's do it of our time of our well-being of our power of our heart so consider that our hearts are extremely intelligent organs so much so that when you walk into a room and you feel something's off. It's not because you think something's off. It's because you feel something is off. So if, if that has any pull, that means that we have a responsibility to learn what this organ is teaching us. What is it saying? And so imagine if we start tapping into that power, we now are having a universal conversation with the world. I could be anywhere and I could not speak the same language as someone. But if I'm tapped into my heart space, now we have a conversation. Now we're connected. So one of the things I'm working on right now. Can I just quick, quickly yes. say, I think there is something <laughs> really interesting about the heart's role in the flesh vehicle that we live in in the physical world because we have yet to figure out exactly how much of this consciousness, how much of this love, how much of this feeling of unity, of transcendence, how much of that comes from our heart. Mm. These are very difficult things to like scientifically hypothesize about and tap into, but we are totally getting there. And it's really exciting to see where we go with that and how much our gut has to do with it. Our gut's a huge part of this too. So it's all really exciting that we just thought it was so much of the brain, but now we're really digging into the brain, the heart, the gut, et cetera, and figuring out this whole intertwining of the whole biological mechanism that we live through. And giving it a voice. Giving it a voice. And it takes yeah. quiet to give it a voice. Yeah. So it means sliding off your screen, going for a walk, turning out, taking out your headphones and listening. It's that simple. It really is that simple. Yeah. But it's scary because we don't do that anymore. So now you're talking to this new stranger that just so happens to be living in your heart. And if we were in a conversation right now, I say this all the time, if we were in a conversation right now and you weren't listening, at a certain point, I'd be like, I'm fed up. I'm not talking to it anymore. That's our heart. So now, years and years and years of us being like, we don't need emotions. Emotions are bad for us. Let's use technology. And now all of a sudden, we're so distanced from this inner voice that actually has our best interest at heart. No pun intended. 
So it's really, it's really an interesting, it's an interesting opportunity, I think, for us, because it's at a young stage. We're at an inflection point, and we need the heart in order to make it to the next stages well, to make it there well. It's, it's a muscle that needs to be trained, the use of the heart, when, when, you're, when we're just reaching for the device, when we're disconnected from empathy and emotional intelligence and love between humans outside of our immediate social circles of our families and whatnot that we have to then go back and retrain because it we brought our experience our level our experience points are very low our level is very low from the birth of a child we must start training that muscle and leveling up that character that experience point that 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 attribute of the heart strength leveling that up really quickly and then that will help lead us into where we'd like to see things move Okay, shall we? I just have to say one thing. (laughs) This is what the whole night's been. I just have to say this. Just one thing. Um, It's all great to sit in quiet and listen to our heartbeat and like love everyone and feel connection and unity. It's great. I love it. But how is it practical, right? That's everyone's real question. How does this make sense in my life? Why is it worth my time? Why is it worth my energy? Why is it worth my investment? The point is, is that we are humans on this planet. And in order to make a difference, in order to keep it going around, we have to strike a balance between accelerated technology and slow living. We're on this planet with a oodles and oodles of technology, and we still need to learn how to live in our most human way. So living slowly, being connected to an earth, being connected to each other, turning off for a second, finding that peace, living in the garden of life. So striking a balance so that way we can actually be our optimized self is important. Because I love the idea of sitting on a mountain, chilling and meditating all day, meditation station. But how do I infuse it into the world? How do I bring the spirituality that I experience in my meditation and share it? Because it's not just for me. Spirituality is, is for the world. It's for all of us to learn and to connect with and to love. So how do we bring that down? Luckily for me, I've caught wind of this fairly early and I've been using, and you too, I've been using the tools of technology to share this spirituality, this consciousness, this education, this wisdom. And, and, and that's the beauty of it. But there's this really delicate balance. And it's important for us to really start to recognize how we're going to integrate this. Yeah. I want you to jump into how to integrate it. You used Strike a Balance. Love that so much. Super fast-paced tech. Slow down, connect to yourself, connect to others, connect to earth. And also you ask, what's the practicality? The practicality is leaving a gorgeous, positive wake and aura everywhere you go. It's amazing. The butterfly effect just goes, just starts going everywhere. Your smile, your groundedness, your love that you radiate goes everywhere. Yeah. It's true. Radiation in the best way possible, (laughs) not in a bad way. (laughs) Um, Let's do the breakdown. Integrating, yes. Yes. So to break down these five elements of well-being, I first start with physical well-being. We need to be physically well in order to bring our light into the world. So what we know that as is exercise, yoga, stretching, nutrition, touch, physical touch is really important. And then we talk more about mental well-being. To give our mind a break, to recharge it, to slow things down, to see things clearly. We don't give ourselves those opportunities. But what does it look like when we do? When you have clarity, 
when you're not pulled in a million directions. In today's age, we are constantly inundated with information. It doesn't stop. Dings and sounds and noises and notifications and vibrations and, and, and billboards and lights and it's exhausting. Yeah. So when we talk about mental well-being, there's a big difference between mental well-being, mental well-being and mental illness. As all things, there is the consistent upkeep and then there's when there's a problem, there's something to do. Mental well-being is an opportunity for us to take care of these things that give us so much insight. So, so, so important when we talk about wellness and well-being. Next is spiritual. So now we've taken care of our body. Our body is in a great space. Our head, now we've taken care of it. We've given it quiet. We've recharged it. We've cleared it out of all the noise. And now spiritually, we give ourselves the opportunity to connect with that deeper self, to connect with that purpose, to connect with each other in that type of way. There's that, there's that, that universe that connects us, that oneness. And when we exist there, there's a lot less disagreement because it speaks the same language. So now we're doing pretty good, feeling good, we're taking care of ourselves. And then what comes next? Emotional wellness. Emotional wellness is key because now I'm in touch with myself. I've given myself that space to spiritually connect what my purpose is, what's my passion, what lights me up in the world. Those are all incredible things. And now, emotionally, I get to connect with myself and I get to connect with others. I get to have empathy. I get to be there with people. Unfortunately, what we're finding is that technology is putting up this barrier. It's distracting ourselves from ourselves. And because we don't know ourselves, we can't know each other. So when we start looking at how technology is impacting our emotional well-being, it goes deeper than, look at her life, it's so nice. Look at that vacation, it's great. I don't have as many friends, I don't have followers, I'm not getting likes. It's so much deeper than that. And those things are all happening. It's important that we talk about that as well. But when we really, the next thing we need to start discussing and educating on is that our emotional well-being exists inside us. How comfortable are we with ourselves to embrace the human emotions that occur? If I have my screen up at all times, I don't have to feel any emotion I don't want to feel. Because I can watch that cat video, and I can watch that scary movie, and I can watch that sitcom, and I, anything I want to see, it's right there for me. I can buy that thing, I can order this now, I can, it's all there. But when you silence that, and you put that aside, you give yourself this opportunity to connect with that self feel those emotions, recognize them, understand what it's doing for you. And when you see a friend in turmoil, you're able to be with them in that instead of just feeling glossed over with no emotions. So that's emotional wellness, really important also. See how we have all these different categories of wellness that up until now like are not really talked about. So now we talk about social wellness. And social wellness is really important as well. We hear the buzzwords like community, connection, authenticity, great words, powerful words, if we know how to use them in our lives. Community isn't about showing up at a place to be seen. It's about allowing yourself to be yourself in a place with others who see you as that self which is really powerful. But the world wasn't built on its own. We need each other. We need to be with each other. We need to understand each other. And so community gives us that opportunity. 
So social wellness is encouraged when we show up in these places, when we connect with others, when we, when we learn about new cultures and new ideas, and we, we step out of ourselves and our worlds and how we see everything. And we enter this world of connection. And when we're in a world of connection, things are a lot more bright and beautiful and happy. But if all I'm doing is not paying attention to the social needs, I'm just isolating myself. And it's hard to do. It's hard to live good, healthy, well life if you're doing that. So five really important distinctions, and I could talk about it forever. But I'm going to leave that there, and we can all let it settle. <laughs> Damn, the breakdown. You can tell it's so much deeper than how we, we've been giving it credit for. Yeah. Because up until now, I'm telling you, you hear wellness, you think smoothie and yoga. <laughs> I'm not the only one. People are like, I don't have time for wellness. I'm building a company. I'm a CEO. I'm a scientist. I'm researching. I don't have time for these things. But we're human beings. All of us are. And when we take care of ourselves in the many different dimensions that we need to be taken care of, we show up. We show up alive. We show up connected. We show up with passion. And that's what's going to change our world. We need that. I don't have to tell you that. I know you know that. That's Maybe I have to tell you guys that. I'm, I'm <laughs> always a work in progress. We're, we're always a work in progress, all of us. We're enjoying the progress of being, process. We're enjoying the process of being a work in progress, all of us. It's really important to do the breakdown and to really feel the breakdown sink in because it gives perspective on the dimensions that we may not be giving enough of our time to. But you can't blame us, right? Because why would we take the time? When it's all... Literally. Why take the time? Why take the... Because taking the time has a compounding effect on all of the, huh, duh, duh, you know, okay. You can do things a little bit differently. You can engage with the technology. You can engage with the business. You can engage with humans in more advanced ways by slowing down and tuning inward and working on the well-being. Okay, I got I to gotta test myself. <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> as, as you know... I like to paraphrase the show that I've learned. So let's see if I can do this. All right. Okay. So physical wellness, stretching, yoga, nutrition, taking breaks away from computer screens, breaks away from hitting the phone up. Okay. Um, mental mental well-being mental well-being is knowing our thought processes our habits knowing our worldview being very tied tightly tied into our truth true understanding of that looking at ourselves well in the mirror Spiritual well-being, connecting to something greater than ourselves, transcending ourselves, connecting to that divine spirit within ourselves and within all of us, with our heart, to that love and consciousness that permeates everything that we can embody and unite with. Um, okay. And then emotional well-being so um, 
the emotional well-being is that we know our own feeling, we give space for our own feeling, we can tune into our own feeling and give space for the feeling of other people around us, our friends, our families, our coworkers, even people on the street that we can give space and, and see people and have, be seen by people in our true authentic selves. And lastly, social well-being. Socially, we want to we want to build really authentic and genuine heart-centric relationships with our families, with our coworkers and our friends. And that social well-being is crucial for building our networks in terms of what we care about building, what, what we find most meaningful to surround ourselves with those people. So I'm going to grade myself at 20%. No, that was great. Complete. <laughs> I'm a harsh critic on myself. I give myself 20%. I got work to do. But, um, but even having the breakdown of the five is so crucial. Yeah, totally. Yeah, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, social, well-being. Having that breakdown in mind is really crucial. The only way, we talk about this a lot, the only way for us to make progress towards these new ways of thinking, these new awarenesses, is to create these breakdowns, to create these neologisms, these new words, these new ways of thinking and breaking things down, which have likely already been developed by civilizations in the past and put into books and put into practice and then forgotten. We see a lot of that with some of the Tibetan Buddhist traditions and whatnot, there's a lot of deep connection to oneself that one practices throughout their life. So with the rebirthing and the resurfacing of these really crucial wisdoms in the technology age to strike that balance. I will say, was, was that a question? It was <laughs> me scoring myself 20% <laughs> after paraphrasing. <laughs> Way more than 20%. You did great. And it's a process. Good teacher. Uh, I will say that it's not just about us forgetting. But all of a sudden you have this new shiny toy that comes in. And it's got everything. And it does everything. And it's never over. And I can just play with it all the time. Why would I read this ancient book? Who cares? Why would I deal with the complex emotions inside of my own body and someone else's body? Yeah, why? Because I've got this shiny new toy. Shiny new toy, the endless variable rewards that come, yeah. It's a hijacking of the mind. Dopamine. Yeah. So I want to talk about really quickly the practicality of all this urban wellness stuff. Okay. Right? Because obviously we want to show up as our whole selves, as we talk about, and it's true. What does it look like? And how do we do it? So being able to integrate practices into your daily life or your weekly life or your monthly life, your yearly, whatever it is, allows us the opportunity to cater and nurture these elements of our life. So daily meditation practice is not always easy. But when you couple your meditation practice with something else that you like or something else that you do daily, all of a sudden, now you're killing two birds, one stone. We all like to do that. We live in a city. We've got things to do. So one of the things that I started doing for myself and what I recognized was that the commuting time on average, Americans spend two hours commuting a day. So that time could be used really wisely. Instead of sitting there scrolling on Instagram or on Facebook or messaging, podcasts are great. But what if we start, started thinking about that time as our time to recharge? How could we show up at home if after a long, stressful day at work, you get to go home to your family, you get to talk to your roommates, 
and you get to be present with them. You get to leave work at home. You get to leave work at work and show up at home. But we're in this constant connectivity that we never get a break. And that's exhausting. So we've looked at it all day. We come home, and what do we do? We watch Netflix. Because what else would we do? So now we watch Netflix. Before we go to bed, we're just going to check our email. And then I go to bed because I'm thinking about all the things I have to do the next day. Three years go by. Whoa, that's intense, but it's real. So integrating small things into your life in a daily basis will be really helpful in making changes, making important, significant changes. So I stop wearing headphones because for me that allows me to connect to my world. I get to hear the birds chirping on the street. I get to hear different languages on the subway. So give yourself the opportunity to tune into your world, and the more you do that, the more you start to feel connected. And the more you start to recognize, this world is actually really beautiful. Even with the darkness, and the sadness, and the struggles, and the changes, there's a lot going on. But there's beauty too, and we're missing that. The practicality of applying urban wellness to our lives goes, taps into every single aspect of what we do. It's super practical, it's super applicable, and all of us want the best for ourselves and our families and our communities, people around us everywhere, even the ones walking across the street that we don't know. But we, up until now, we don't know how. Yeah. We've, we've, it may even be that we really well practiced this in more ancient times and that the shiny object, the endless stream of dopamine. Yeah, the shiny object takes us away from the, the practices, totally. And we sh go Shiny ahead. objects. Go ahead. The shiny objects, yeah. Now I have a watch and I have a phone and I have a tablet and I have a computer and, TV. and I've got the TV and I've got Alexa over there. Alexa over there too. She's amazing. Alexa is amazing. <laughs> The Alexa in the room just beeped at us. That's so funny. Okay, let's transition to the war on tech. Hold up. Before you even think about it, technology has enabled us to do incredible things throughout our lives. It's super cool that we can just call each other across the world and video chat. Amazing. We also have to acknowledge the fact that during the Cold War, we almost had mutually assured destruction twice. And then we dropped a bomb, two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But regardless, <laughs> this is some really, there's been, technology can be used in so many different ways in surgical applications for extending people's lives, giving them more time with their families and creative, creative time. The application of technology for all of the human flourishing is incredible. And we do want that to be well known. Like, thank you, that is amazing. Bless all of the people that have made this technology, electricity, fridges, the ubiquity and all the things we have. Thank you, thank you. Traveling across the world in just a couple hours via plane, whoa. But on the same conversation point, we must address the nuance of where technology has caused quite a bit of malevolence, mental health issues, addiction. Take it away. So it's a tool. Technology has always been a tool. Whether it was a spear made out of a stone, that was technology. And it was a tool. It had a purpose. Today, we have technology. It has a purpose. But when we start to give our freedoms away to the tools that run our life, we lose our sense and our power as humans. So thinking about it as like a war might be dramatic, but it's important to recognize that we are at war with our technology 
every single second of the day. We need to strike the balance. Strike the balance. It's really, really important. I recognize in my modern life how hard it is to actively choose to strike a balance day in and day out. Because there's always something else pulling me. And I'm conscious of this. So imagine now you have no idea that there's even this issue going on. And you wonder why you're tired, why you feel alone, all these things. It's because we're not aware of the impact it's making on us. So use it. Use it as a tool. Use it when you need it. And if you're not sure what you need it for and why you're using it, turn it off. You'll know why. Oh, I haven't called my mom today. That's a good reason to use your phone. Totally. Call your mom. Totally. If you're reaching for it because you don't want to talk to that person, you don't want to make eye contact with that person, you, any number of reasons, that is a red flag. And so it, it, it is very valuable to turn off the phone and to see how, how you're feeling, what's coming up, and take note. And we mentioned this earlier. <clears throat> it's, and we have some cool social experiments we've been talking about, but this is totally a responsibility of ourselves to grassroots this feeling from within ourselves and bring it out, the well being across all those dimensions. Simultaneously, it's a responsibility of the massive technology companies that have now found themselves as the biggest influencers on society, even more so than took over the banks in the last 10 years as the largest influencers of society. Same goes in China and the other parts of the world. And now it's their responsibility as well to help us with the mental health and well-being, spiritual actualization, social actualization, etc. in our lives. It's their responsibility simultaneously. And it would be more powerful to see it come from within the corporations, in my opinion, than it would be to see it come from government regulations. We want to see it come from within the hearts of the executive leadership at these companies and right. from the grassroots leadership at these companies rather than have a government regulation strike down to say that they have to behave this way. It's much better to come from within. So it's two-sided. It's from us, from our own selves, and it's as well as from the ones that are providing these technology services, both. I mean, you talk about this all the time, but it's really, what does the future of the planet look like? With such an increase in the population, it's so many eyes on these apps and channels and platforms. There is a need and an opportunity and a responsibility more than all of those things to recognize the impact that these tools are having and to do something about it. It's great that the people who started all this technology won't let their kids use it. That's awesome. But what about the rest of the people on the planet? That doesn't matter. Those people don't matter. So I agree with you. There is a responsibility of leadership, both within ourselves and with the corporations, to make a difference, to make an impact. And we've been now outlining some of the solutions. We have this linked in the bio for you to check out. Alexa has a great video called Transformation Transportation. And it's very short, just one minute, and it's super powerful. Thank you. It's very, very powerful. Thank you. I appreciate that. We are about to have meditation, cars, trains, airplanes, these heart-centric environments for people to connect to themselves and others in these hours that we spend transiting. 
teach us about this? So I'll tell you what really made me conceptualize this yeah. movement. <sighs> I was sitting on the subway car, as normal, and someone comes on to the train and they say, Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to interrupt, but as of yesterday, my house burned down. My three girls, my wife, we're, we're out of everything. We have no furniture, we have no, we have no clothes. And if there's anyone who has anything to provide or share or give, we would be really, really appreciative. And it was like my biggest fear had just happened in front of my eyes because nobody on the train looked up. Not only did they not look up, they didn't even flinch. They didn't even hear it. So I'm like, this is what I was hoping wouldn't happen. We're so disconnected from each other so glazed over. No one's saying that we had to hand over the shirt off our back, but no one could even acknowledge his pain, his struggle, wish him luck, acknowledge him, look at him. So there's this awful feeling how broken we are, how broken it is. So in that moment on that train, I'm looking at this. Something has got to change. So I noticed that if you're not sitting on the subway with your headphones in, you would have at least heard it and you would have at least felt something. And then what happened to that feeling? And what do you do with that? And when you feel feelings, you either stuff it away or you recognize this is a really powerful feeling. What is it telling me? What can I learn from it? Why am I feeling this way? Why am I feeling this way? There's so much going on in our hearts that we're not giving it any attention. So I decided to redesign the commuter experience to use that time as a time to tap in to pay attention, to listen to yourself, to, to connect with the people around you, and to use that time as a powerful and consistent, because you're commuting daily, mm. time to practice presence, to practice connecting with yourself, connecting with others, and being there for each other. So transformation transportation was built and designed for humans to get their heart back. And this is just the beginning because the, the way that we show up when we do that consistently, the way it compounds in our lives and it makes a difference, we show up to work happier. We're able to deal with other people around us that usually challenge us differently. We get to leave the drama at work or at home there and we get to show up at our new destination as a different person, as, a, as, as our, that true person we want to be. So we have power. It starts here. It's a choice. Then it's a practice. Then it's a conversation and then it's a movement. Practicality is wise. It's quite a simple roadmap. The first thing is that conscious choice, that conscious choice when we are there, basically in the train car, doing the transit in the car, in the plane, in the morning when we wake up, before we grab the phone. Check in with ourselves, check in with how we're feeling, check in with our environment, look at the other humans around us. 
Take some deep breaths, close our eyes, feel our bodies. That conscious choice leads to everything else pretty much going really well after that point. But we have to keep practicing that conscious choice and we have to practice going into the zones of fear. There was a really good sign in Manhattan on a big garage near the near the financial district that said acknowledge the fear and then do it anyway do it anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's such a good one and so we continue the practice of consciously making the choice, acknowledging that, yep, this might be uncomfortable, but I'm gonna go talk to the guy that literally just said that he's home burned down. And we're gonna work that muscle of the heart, work that muscle of the emotional intelligence and well-being, work that muscle of connecting other humans, and bonus, working that muscle will help you outpace the rate of automation. Yes. At least you will be at the very end of the time period of automation taking over most of our work. So work out that heart-centric muscle. So there's a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's, let's talk about this. Yes. Okay, you just came back from Israel how long ago? Uh, probably two weeks at this point. Okay. So Alexa was in Israel in January yes. of 2019. And she experienced Shabbat. She experienced a bunch of interesting things while you were there. The just groundedness to such an ancient area with so much civilizational history. Teach us. Okay. So it's hard to say and a few short words, but what I will say and share is that to the depth that we give ourselves the opportunity to explore ourselves is how we will connect with spirituality. It's within us and it expands above us. So it takes time, it takes choice, it takes practice, and it takes presence. So learning that there's this there's more going on than we realize. It's so easy to get caught up in our day to day, one thing to the next, that we, we very rarely stop and take a step back and look around. One of the things that I love and I hold on to so much is this concept of Shabbat. Because God created the world in six days. And then on the seventh, he took a step back and he looked at it. And he said, isn't this place great? And if he did that, why wouldn't we? What makes us better? That we can't stop, that we have to do more, that we always have to be because all artists need to take a step back and look. And it's in those moments when you stop, it's the clarity, the dust settles. There's not so much noise, but you get this incredible foresight into what our reality is offering us. And then you go back to it with all this renewed energy, which is incredible. Yeah, that's a huge lesson to take away from Judaism as well as other practices around the world work on things like fasting, things like uh, prayer, connecting to something that transcends you, something divine. I would like to say God in, in, in many ways is so interesting seeing people talk about God from different religions but then not want to sort of talk to the other one about what their God is. Because this God that is thrown around so much 
whether it be a six days and seventh day of rest and like, oh, wow, this is amazing, or whether it just be all that is, God being all that is, everything, everything, that that connects us all, that that connects us all. And I want to say Shabbat's very interesting because Shabbat is, um, it's a rest or a cessation. And this is actually a major practice in conscientiousness as well, is when you're, you know, when you're done on, on Friday evening with some of your hustle, you're just like, yo, until Saturday night, I'm not going to touch my work stuff. I'm going to actually focus on these five dimensions of well-being. And you actually follow through and you do that. And then Saturday night comes around and you're like, damn, I'm hella refreshed. I'm super ready to get back at it. And so the more that you set these goals for yourself and work on this conscientious muscle as well with this well-being muscle, you set these goals and you actually achieve them, the stronger you will become at everything you set your mind to. It's so, so crucial. Goal setting and execution, especially with resting. Um, it's, it will help you a lot to want to tell your eight hours of sleep, gotta do it, gotta do it. Exercising, I gotta do it. Meditating, I got to do it and set these things up and go and do them. Bonding with some random person because you want to ask them a question and become a little uncomfortable and test it out, you got to do it. You got to set these goals. You got to try. You got to do it. There's different colors on the color wheel. People can have different lives. They can choose what they want to do. Um, <clears throat> um, also, just quitting a lot of the toxic habits that we have. The, the toxic habit of constantly needing to connect and check and all that stuff, the constant habit of wanting to dis distract ourselves with the next the next drug, the next alcohol, the next the next cannabis, the next LSD or psilocybin or, or DMT or ah, the next dopamine hits. They're they're just they just like. Feels good. It is a drug. And Sadhguru is one of my favorite quotes about it. He's like, he's like, I never do drugs, but I'm always high. You know? <laughs> I'm like, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's how we do it, my man. That's how we do it. Because you can totally have, he also says, every breath is ecstasy. And it's, of course, it's much harder to have every breath be ecstasy when you don't have clean water and etc. So that's why we're raising the baseline of living across the planet as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, every breath, that is it. So for me, Shabbat has served as a tool, a tool to strike a balance between technology and slow living. Because it's in those moments of slow living I optimize myself to use technology in the physical space to optimize my reality. Yeah. So it's this incredible dance that when you tap into your spiritual potential, you have more clarity on how to use the technology. You use it, it doesn't use you, and you move forward. It's incredible. The better you get at the strike a balance dance, the more effectively you realize your fullest potential into the world. Yes. That's a fact. I agree, yeah. I agree with that. I've been trying to preach it in, non, in the not nuanced, descriptive way that you've been preaching it. I really like that. But that breakdown is really crucial. I'm going to start using it more often. I'm coming at you. <laughs> I'm coming at you. I'm coming at myself, too. I'm working on this. Okay. Um, last couple questions on the way out. Let's start with what is your superpower? So I've been holding this very near and dear to my heart. What's very so interesting about the work I'm doing is that right now, the name Alexa 
is the pinnacle of technology. Everyone's got an Alexa. That's technology. Eden, which is my middle name, like the Garden of Eden, is the slowest, most peaceful place. And what's funny to me is that this duality exists in the essence of my name. And I'm using technology to bring peace into the world. To bring this peace of mind, this Garden of Eden lifestyle, to our modern world. So, it's this essence that I'm existing in. And I want to say that my superpower is peace. And I feel really good about that. My superpower is peace. <laughs> That's so funny that your name is basically strike a balance <laughs> between the pinnacle of tech and the calmest. Yes. Very cool place. I love that. That's so funny. It's interesting. And I live in Manhattan, which is like the Again. so not the place of. And you have r helped run a festival that goes out into the middle of nature and immersion and stuff. So again, you, yeah, yeah, that contrast as well. It's good that you picked peace as a superpower. I love that. And also, I'm obsessed with world peace. Obsessed, <laughs> obsessed. We're so going to get there. Let's fucking do it. Let's fucking do it. Okay, next question. What would you say is a core driving principle of your life? Oh, that's a good one. core driving principle in my life fulfillment taking an untraditional entrepreneurial route has taught me the value of fulfillment in ways that I wouldn't have otherwise experienced if I was caught up in all the other things I could be measuring my life in years, numbers, bank accounts, a whole number of things. But throughout all of it, what I've come to learn is that fulfillment is the most special thing that you can have in a moment, in a relationship, in a project, in a movement, in a conversation, in anything. I think that that really drives me. Mm. And if you could rebuild civilization from scratch, how would you design it? Lots of plants, a lot of plants. Delicious smells, really good food. Gotta have good food. Um, and creative expression. I think we're lacking that. I think, I think technology can oftentimes get in the way of our creativity. And I think it's a really important process for human beings. So I would want there to be this, con this, this setup for creativity where people could feel free to express themselves in any way they wanted. Because coming from a world, before I knew what self-expression was, I thought I was expressing myself. And then I learned. 
all the things that I didn't say, that I wanted to say, that I could have said, but I was afraid to say because I didn't want to hurt that person, because I didn't want to look that way, and I didn't want them to think that way of me. That's a lot of not self-expression. But then you learn to do it, and you realize, what if we could all do that? What if we could all express ourselves freely, powerfully, meaningfully, productively? I would want to build a, a civilization built on that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's like the pinnacle of civilization is where all are being creatively expressed to their fullest. I like that a lot. How about we ask you, tell us about what you've connected to that's past this 3D reality. I close my eyes because for me, I want to make sure that I am not distracted by my surroundings in my responses. And I feel that every question has its own, its, its own power in how it impacts me and my process. And to reflect on a time where I connected to something outside of this 3D reality I would say I was in Jerusalem and I was meditating at my hotel and I felt this really powerful vibration all up and down my back. And I had never felt that before. And it was like I welcomed it. I embraced it. It was a little bit overwhelming because I was like, this is new. <laughs> and at the same time, I didn't feel afraid. I felt sh secure and connected. This is what we can feel when we tap deeply into ourselves and how we are connected to everything. And it's a profound awareness shift. How about, do you think this is a simulation? I'm like, this place right now, where we are? <laughs> Simulate. Hold on, let me change the code quick. Yeah, change the code, change the code. Okay. I haven't given it much thought. When I think about it, I choose not to because I don't think that helps me. For me, I don't think that it provides value. Maybe it is. And maybe it's not. We may know soon enough. <laughs> we may know. All right, last question. Okay. What is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh. I would say looking into someone's eyes so deeply that you see them for all that they are. When you are so present and so connected 
and you're really with someone, the most beautiful thing. There's just, it's a, it's a palpable, it's, it's a special moment. And I think it's the most beautiful. The research is becoming more and more clear that by taking these really long periods of time to look at someone else's eyes really intimately and try and see them for all that they are and they see you for all that you are, holy cow, the interconnectedness just, just skyrockets. Really? Yeah. There's, it's just you do oxytocin flow. There's no feeling of of I hate you even if this is a maybe a conservative and a liberal or maybe someone from China and someone from the US or whatever it may be so because you that is another part of the what's beyond the 3D is what's what's embodying the what spirits embodying the flesh vehicles right now can we tap into that better can we understand that better can we poke it with a scientific tool hypothesize maybe um holy cow this has been epic <laughs> seriously i had a feeling it would be but this was super epic yeah yeah me too had a feeling and it ended up being super epic yes yeah <laughs> alexa thank you for joining us on the show thank you for having me thank yeah. you for having me <laughs> yeah i feel like i should call you eden now you know it's like the tranquil like i would love that I'm, I'm transitioning to Eden. I love it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Slowly, yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like I need to hug you instead of shake your hand on the way out. <laughs> I'm here to give you a hug. Thank you. Thank you. What a time. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Keep up the good work, Miss Eden. Keep up the good work. Thank you for creating this platform. This platform is meant for people like you. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Give us your thoughts. We'd love to start a conversation about these topics. Also, go and check out some of Alexa Eden's work with the links below. Go and check it out. Also, we would love to request everyone to start having more conversations about these five breakdowns of well-being and this urban wellness. Let's really start having these conversations amongst each other, grassroots the movement up through ourselves as well as get some of the tech powers to help as well. Strike a balance. Strike a balance, everyone. <laughs> Much love. Keep supporting epic people like Alexa, epic people like us, so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site to cool places like New York and doing interviews. Much love, everyone. Build the future. Manifest your destiny into the world to its fullest. Much love. We'll see you soon. Peace. <laughs> yeah. That was fantastic. That was good. Yeah. We talked about a lot of things. You rocked it. Thank you. So well. Thank you. I was like, whoa. Flows. You were, you were like, you're just like flow and it was dope.